Hey everyone, this is History Clarified, and welcome back to the History Roundtable podcast. I'm here with Craig from NBS History, and we are going to talk about the Winter War, the Soviet Union, different ethnicities in the USSR, how it affected the Red Army, and just kind of a grab bag of the Eastern Front. Well, happy to be here. And happy to have you back. It was a lot of fun the last time. So... What are your thoughts on the Winter War? Why do you find it so engaging? Why is it for, you know, kind of a sideshow almost, it would seem, compared to some of the larger fronts? Why is this such a sticking point? And why does it have kind of, why did it punch above its weight class really in the effects on the Soviet Union and international perceptions? Well, I have to say a lot, there's not a fair amount of people except for people who are interested in history that actually know about this war in the first place. And a lot of people will be very confused because you'd be talking about a small war that's during World War II. Mm. The thing that I always found interesting about the Winter War personally is the fact that the Finns literally pushed back the Russians or the Soviet Union. We, and as we've had a conversation, uh, we should mm -hmm. not call them the Russians. That's quite uh, a Western outlook. They were yeah, our, our, of, yeah, our Westernism is showing. They were a group of many different ethnicities, a lot of which saw the reign of terror under Stalin, uh, the Cossacks mm. especially in the beginning, <laughs> who were kicked off their farms aggressively. But uh, for the Winter War, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not going to lie. The thing that always struck me was, if you ever look up who is one of the greatest soldiers who's ever fought in any war in history, and a few names spring up, and... Uh, what's his name? It's hard to pronounce. Simu Haya, I believe it's Simunya Haya, the mm. White Death. He was a sniper that apparently has a confirmation of 509 kills during this war, of which he was a sniper. So, I mean, it was fascinating to learn just about his experience and the fact that he survived to the age of 96, surprisingly, even though he was shot mm. through the jaw. And overall, seeing the political situation of Finland just before the war occurred, they tried their best to deal with, lack for better words, a bully. The Soviet Union mm. simply wanted those eastern parts because they were heavily industrialized, and I mean, they're being imperialistic at this point. I, I know that Soviet historians argue their point that the rationale was they were trying to make a buffer zone because they assumed the Germans would use Finland as a route to come and attack them later. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, it, it's kind of almost bland imperialism they just wanted to take some of the cookies out of the jar and i mean the Finns had to re you know they, they had to back off and give them some of the greatest parts of their country and then when it was too much they made a stand and surprisingly i would argue they won at least the winter war mm. yeah i mean they ceded territory but the effects were amazing like reading uh at i'll show it for everyone Reading Alan Clark's Barbarossa, it's a little bit of an older source. I think it's uh, 72, but he talks about how the fight in Finland was so damaging to the Soviets that it actually made them rethink their tank doctrine. Like, what they were doing is they were massing tanks, which before the purges, that was the idea, was deep battle. Mass tanks, planes, artillery, infantry kind of do what the Germans do. You know, we call it Blitzkrieg, but Wagen's Krieg is probably more accurate war movement. But the Soviets, the way it actually turned out with how they were fighting in 39 and 40 was the tanks kept outrunning the infantry. And in Finland, where it is very forested, very swampy, the tanks would go out unsupported, and a lot of them were light tanks, you know, your T-26s, things like that, yeah. and your BT series. And the Finns, you know, we actually get Molotov cocktail from them, not from the Soviets. Yeah, it was actually and Molotov so, cocktails they were using to try and, uh, some of the older tank models, they had an auxiliary port in the back, I believe, and they would throw the Molotovs inside, it would get into mm -hmm. the tank and just kill every, well, burn them out, basically. Yeah. And so, you know, anti-tank rifles and anti-tank grenades, regular grenades, improvised weapons like the Molotov cocktail, and the Finnish infantry were just able to pounce on these Soviet tanks, and the tanks were undefended because they had no infantry support, very little air, very little artillery, and they just wrecked shop to the point where Clark argues 
it made the Soviets rethink, and I think Hill would agree, uh, anyone who hasn't read Hill, the Red Army, it made them rethink the idea of using tanks so deep in enemy territory, which, you know, if you really think about it, they weren't following their doctrine of the letter of the law because they should have had infantry and air and artillery support. But after the purges and in the middle of the expansion of the Red Army, and I know the purges are definitely up for debate as for how many officers were purged versus how many came back versus what, you know, was the officer corps way bigger than we thought? You know, was it actually 30 to 50 percent or was it more like 10? But the Soviets definitely in that war had trouble controlling and using these tanks effectively. And the result is that in 1941, when the Germans invade Barbarossa, the Soviets do have some giant mechanized cores and they do use those not to great effect. It's actually the biggest tank battle in World War II and it's a disaster for the Soviets. Like half the tanks don't even make it. But what they do throughout 1941 is actually get increasingly small tank brigades. It starts as like 93 tanks per brigade. And by the end, it's like 46, I believe. And they just disperse those amongst the infantry because they're so afraid of having tanks go off by themselves because Finland really scarred them that much. It made them rethink their doctrine. And it's interesting, like you say, even though Finland ceded territory... That looks like a like a public relations win that it made the Soviets rethink that. It certainly was, but yeah, I I can't remember the percentage. I actually a long time ago in siege of a uh, s- uh, small college in Quebec, you have to go to it mm. before university. I had to do a small essay on this. The industry in the areas they were they had to give up to the Soviet unions. I think it equaled up to either thirty or forty percent of their GDP. Mm. basically it was almost suicide and i mean it's why they had to take a stand in the first place but it 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 could be argued if they just took the stand at the beginning before giving up some of the territory they did before the war actually began it probably would have worked out a lot better in their favor and in the continuation war they did reclaim the territories and even push close to leningrad but Mm -hmm. i mean you you would argue I happen to have dated a Russian, and her father was uh, in the Soviet Union, obviously. And he even says himself, it's a stain on their society. Like, they actually criticize themselves for starting the war and saying it was unjust and how terrible the performance was and how it, w- it really was an embarrassment. If you look mm. at the performance of, I mean, it's they, they always compare it to Afghanistan. Yeah. Yeah. So it, that kind of gives you a, like a mental image of like how it fits in their mind. But uh, if mm-hmm. anyone's interested, I'll just put it up. I had an article explaining just one interesting aspect that Finland, you know, it had its own civil war before this all occurred, and it was their red uprising, and the communists did not win. Mm. Stalin and the other communists were obviously not happy to see Finland not go completely capitalist, but they definitely weren't going to go communist, and they were always trying to put in insurgency. So this was a long time coming. And this article I just have up here by Kimo Rentola, it's uh, the Finnish communists in the Winter War. It just briefly kind of summarizes why the war occurred in the first place and how the Soviets Mm. were trying their best to not go to war at the beginning. They really wanted to politically just annex Finland, but there was no way that Finland was going to do this, obviously. Finland was looking at the British and the other allies, you know, for a helping hand, they weren't really willing. And then there was that awkward moment when the war began and then the continuation war where Churchill himself said to the Finnish, you need to um, stop attacking the Soviet Union. Obviously, we're allies with them. And if you do this, you're going to be declared as part of the Axis, which they indirectly were. Mm. And the allies, well, my country, Canada, India, the rest had to declare war on Finland, even though there was only one single engagement on in the North Sea, it was just like one ship got shot at or something. It was kind of just for show, but uh, mm. Finland was... It's interesting how they came out of World War II after everything is said and done, because they were technically, an, I, what would you call it, an unofficial Axis member? Mm. Sort of like Romania. Yeah, like... They had a weird alliance just because really, like you say, they wanted their own territory back. And once they hit it, like they were kind of good. And that was a 
piece of friction between them and the Germans is they didn't want to advance past that line. They wanted to reclaim their land, and that was basically their war goal. Yeah. Whereas, obviously, Hitler and the Wehrmacht, they wanted them to push as much as they could and put more pressure on Leningrad, but... Yeah. It just... It amazed me, because like you say, talking about a stain, between the purges, which I, I know the results are debated, but at least back then they were definitely perceived as, you know, really big, and, and the way the Winter War went, it's one of the reasons that Churchill and Roosevelt really didn't place high esteem in the Soviet fighting ability, at least early in the war. Like in one of my videos, I have the quote from an American ambassador, William C. Bullitt, who says, I don't know anyone who thinks that the Soviet army is going to be the German army. And that was kind of the perception. And part of it was the purges and part of it was Finland. And that actually hurt Germany because Hitler saw that and the world saw that and he thought he could take the USSR, which, as we know, definitely didn't work out for him, but it made the USSR look so weak and vulnerable that with tanks and artillery and air power in huge numbers compared to Finland, they couldn't do anything. And really, they just got land ceded to them because Finland thought, OK, eventually they might just crush us with sheer numbers. Yeah, uh, in it's just fascinating. In particular, I think it was the very first bombing raid on, it wasn't the capital, I think it's called Sortavala, if I'm not mistaken. I think I have a map here. But the, the Soviets tried to bomb an industrialized area, and they lost every single bomber to just a few fighters that the uh, Finnish had. And it was like Hitler found out about this, and it was hilarious. Like, he really, it's like you said, Hitler's presumptions of the performance of the Soviet Union during the Winter War really mm -hmm. gave him that idea that they were just going to be stomped. Okay. Yeah, and like, you know, that hurts Germany in the end, but at the time they were like licking their chops, thinking it was easy pickings. And, yeah. you know, there's the very, very, oh, there's some Finland 140. Yeah, they thought it was like easy pickings. I'm just glancing through my Hill book about the Red Army, seeing if he agrees with uh, Clark about the psychological effects. But it screwed them over because the famous quote, you know, it's a house of cards. We'll kick the door down and the whole rotting structure will yeah. come down. And that just that didn't work out. Oh, no. Uh, I forgot to mention the, the Winter War occurred just after the Estonians basically just got taken by the Soviet Union aggressively. Mm -hmm. And I know even today, the East Estonia has a special place with Finland as far as work work is concerned, and they trade a lot. But the Estonians were the ones who were going to be used with groups of ethnic Finns to be some of the units to be uh, well, used during the Winter War, I guess, because they thought they knew the area. But I found that very curious if it's true, because I would imagine the Soviets would not want to use units that would have any dual loyalty because one of the biggest issues during the winter war was the soviets presumed communists would uprise in finland to help and they didn't like the statistical numbers are almost none of the communists helped they all picked up a rifle to fight for their country and they didn't have any worker revolts like it was very minimal that's mm. very surprising because <laughs> there was a lot of communists yeah i don't know as much about estonia and like the Courland or Cortland pot like all that I I need to bring myself up on that but in Poland and I say Poland like World War II Poland you know there were Western Ukrainians and Western Belarusians due to yeah. the way the 1920s shook out in the 1930s but you know if you trust Antony Beaver and I know he's very critical of the Soviets that's probably the most fair way I can say it to both sides He's very, very critical of the Soviets, but, I mean, he talks about how the uh, police arm of the NKVD, that their hands were full with deserters, and a lot of it was Belarusians and Poles and Ukrainians. Like, as they passed through that territory, that was a lot of the people they were going after. And, you know, with the NKVD, is it right, wrong, you know... How much of it was perceived in paranoia versus how many were actually deserters? That's one of the issues with that, one of the issues with Beaver sometimes. But it definitely seems plausible for like Estonia or Finland because at least according to Beaver's arguments, they experienced that as they went west into Berlin. And 
they were very displeased with the non-Russian ethnicities as they passed over their own territory. Yeah, definitely. And uh, here, I'll just put up another article for people to see. This one was highlighting what you were saying about Poland. It's just a census, 1939, looking at what Poland Poland's population was. Because I also did, I was ignorant towards this as well. It's like you said, they were mm -hmm. very, there was a significant portion of Ukrainians. There was just in the, is this only Eastern or is this, I think this is all of Poland. 4.5 million Ukrainians, 1.5 million Belarusians. 1 million Germans, and other minor ethnic groups. About 7 million Jews, yeah. Very large proportion of Jews in Poland who were not assimilating to Poland, too. That's something that's been noted in mm. this article, that of all the countries that the Jews were living in, apparently they didn't assimilate too well to Polish culture. What I, I wonder what it says about that, because now this is getting off topic, but I thought the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, if you go back far enough, was... I gotta watch how I put this. They were accommodating at least for, like, Middle Age and Renaissance standards to the Jews. Like, I, I know a lot of Europeans weren't truly accommodating, Whoa. especially back then, but, like, I, you know, at least I was of the understanding that Poland had one of the better reputations for it well they definitely had to because they had the largest population of jewish people <laughs> so mm -hmm. there has to be some reason and now they're the most hardcore catholics in the world <laughs> yeah here i'll put up some more you know the fo the photography of the winter war is also quite amazing it's 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 surreal seeing people on skis using submachine guns yeah, but uh, you know, we we were mentioning earlier, off uh, off recording, but, but the Soviets picked that up, oh, and yeah. in the counteroffensives of 1941 and early 1942, that winter, like uh, Max Hastings has accounts of Germans, kind of freaking out because you know they had it was so cold in some cases in that winter, the fuel was freezing in the lines of the uh, half tracks and the armored cars and the tanks. And now here come the Soviets on skis, super mobile, and the Germans' biggest advantage isn't working. And then they're wondering, what do we do? Oh my God, do we have to be a static defense? I don't like this. I always love the uh, tidbit information, the differences of fuel sources the Soviets were using against the Germans in Operation Boborossa was over, and then they got stuck during the winter. They, their fuel was freezing, and all the German tanks mm -hmm. and the Soviets were free-ranging at that point. It's a weird advantage to have, but my god, it worked. It is, and <laughs> that also brings up the funny thing. The Soviets, like... Man, there's so many myths about that too. Uh, I don't know. Do you have you watched a lot of lectures from uh, David Glantz and Jonathan House? David Glantz, I remember hearing. Yes. Yeah, he he's like. I mean, if you're a Westerner, I'll throw that out because I get called on that a lot. <laughs> I was just told today to delete myself because how dare an American speak about uh, the oh. Russian? Oh. Yeah. The. Yeah, he's like, how can you talk about Russian or German history, American? Delete yourself. I'm like, okay, cool. Like, But um, Glantz talked about, you know, one of the tropes, and Clark kind of gets into this. That's where that book shows that age I was reaching for, and it fell off my chair because I'm a genius. Uh, <laughs> um, that the Soviets learned to only attack in one place at one time, and that was brilliant, and like, no, Stalin held on to that way longer than we think. The reason that it kind of weighed, made its way down to history, that these were very local counteroffensives, is because the ones that were so badly mismanaged in that winter campaign, they never really made it down to history. The Soviets tried to forget them. Yeah. And the German and the Germans, like, this is how it's so weird. We lose entire battles in history because if the Soviets ignore it and want to forget it because it was a disaster and it was so mismanaged that the Germans didn't notice it and didn't really write down anything in their own records except, oh, fierce counterattacks. You know, if you read Guderian, he'll do that a lot. You don't know, like, was it a local thing? Was it a big thing? They had no idea, but 
there were a ton of battles like that. And one of the things Glantz argues is a lot of the Germans did want to pull back and they were so freaked out and there were a couple almost encirclements or very small encirclements and Glantz argues that Hitler was actually correct to stop that and to not allow withdrawal because the winter was so cold they would have left the entrenchments and what shelter they did have they really didn't have the reserves for it and if it turned into a general route they would have been worse off yeah so that, that was an interesting thing because we have the perception that Hitler was always wrong. His generals were always right because we read what the generals say. And that's obviously like Manstein and Guderian and Halder. They're going to make that argument. Why would they want to take blame for the war? Yeah, of course. And, you know, instead it's like, no, I know they have skis, guys. And I know their tanks are running and ours aren't. But you got to stay in the trench, fight it out or else. Because, you know, as we like to remind people, even if it sounds like we're defending one side by trying to demystify stuff, these are always like two totalitarian regimes fighting. They're different flavors of totalitarian, but they're both totalitarian. And like you mentioned, you know, I've seen a debate in my comment section with the, I'm going to try Holodomer, the, you know, the Ukrainian famine between if it's one million or six million Ukrainians. And it was kind of interesting to me seeing, like, we're really going to vilify or defend Stalin based on if it's one million, he's a good guy. If it's six million, it's, he's a bad guy. And, like, it, it just, you know, you got to remember it was dictatorships on both sides. And like you say, Finland Yes, the Soviet Union, back when it was the Russian Empire, used to own Finland, so they thought they had territorial claims. But, you know, Stalin was very savvy geopolitically, and Finland was not the only one. Like you mentioned, the Baltic Republics were right around then, took half of Poland, took Bessarabia, or Bessarabia from Romania, excuse me. Like, this was kind of a pattern. And buffer zone for the good of the revolution or not you know it sure looks like typical geopolitical imperialism you know just for the audience because i know especially since we're both involved in history we just take things for granted but i think it would be surprising for some people to learn exactly what occurred in poland when the nazis and the russians basically split the country in half and it just you know ripped a good chunk out of it because mm -hmm. one thing that's overlooked a lot is especially with the NVKD, like when they were coming in and mass murdering Poles and Jews for that matter, they just mm -hmm. blamed it on the Nazis after the war was done. But if you look at the numbers of people in Eastern Poland that were killed by the Soviets, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Like I, for people who don't know, and this is where William Shire and uh, rise and fall of the third Reich is at its best looking at documents and cables the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact wasn't just they weren't going to attack each other. They very explicitly divided Europe. And, like, that's where they both decided they were going to split Poland. It's where, you know, Germany was going to have more reign over Yugoslavia and Romania. And that they were going to get uh, Mamel from Lithuania. And... It was, it was like very deliberate, almost just drawing a line on a map of Europe saying like, yeah, these are our empires. And like you say in Poland, you know, not just the initial invasion, but when the Soviets especially go back through in 1944 and 45, they were brutal. Yeah. And especially for the non-communist Poles, even though they were fighting against the Germans as well. Like the NKVD horribly repressed the non-communist Poles and didn't trust them. And even communist Poles were often arrested and interrogated and went through the whole, you know, an NKVD interrogation. You know, you're, you're getting beaten and tortured. It just kind of is how it is in a lot of cases because Stalin and the NKVD and Beria were so paranoid that Poland was just going to like declare itself independent. And, you know, I was listening to Beaver and he, he's talking about like 
even the British and Americans, there's like incidents in Poland and that he was a Stalin was a first. The U.S. and Britain and the West were going to like support Poland. And that was one of the big sticking points when they had the Yalta conference is Stalin is like, I need a, quote, strong and independent Poland and I get to decide the borders. And, you know, obviously he's setting up a puppet state, but yeah, of course. Yeah, and then there's the debates about the Warsaw Uprising, which, you know, yeah. I'm going to be honest, like, I can't take a side whether he had a military reason to wait or if he was deliberately letting them get killed. I've seen both sides. I have not claimed one, but there's definitely a debate that he let it happen because mm. then, you know, he he would get to control who the next government would be in. So yeah, just just brutal stuff. Actually, I, I just for the people seeing from my point of view, I just put up another article just to explain to people look this up. The one interesting thing this article talks about is the second time round when the Soviets come in. Now that Poland has gone through literal hell, interestingly, the Jewish population that's surviving in the eastern part apparently was trying its best to survive. Well, obviously. But it was trying to attach mm -hmm. itself to any Soviets that were coming. And they would be like, okay, we're, we're for the communist cause. We'll fight for you, et cetera, et cetera. When the Poles started to see this, who were non-Jewish, the whole strope about, you know, Jews are just the forces of Bolshevism and they're just with the communists, it came up. So this whole stereotype started to emerge. And I don't know if you've heard, it's a little bit more recent, but they're saying that the Polish population had a significant hand in getting rid of some of their Jewish friends or neighbors. And mm -hmm. it's a, I know it's a very controversial topic about how much the Polish population aided the effort to get rid of the Jews, but apparently this article is making the argument that because the surviving Jews during the second turnaround were so gung-ho about joining the Soviets just to get out of there, apparently the mm. Poles really saw this as a betrayal. Yeah, that, I mean, I don't know Poland firsthand in their opinion on Jews, and this is highly up for debate, so I know someone is going to take offense, but I will either, at least, I yeah. yeah, I will at least cite my source. Um, if you've read Ordinary Men, and oh, I have my book downstairs. Is it Browning? I think it's Browning. Let me Google real quick. Uh, yeah, Christopher Browning's Ordinary Men, and the kind of stated goal of the book is to explore regular German police battalions who, you know, they weren't like hardcore Nazis. That's kind of how could they commit war crimes and be part of, of the, uh, you know, final solution? How did they get to that point? And a lot of the accounts as they explore this police battalion uh, 101, it looks like their trans uh, transformation talks about occupied people like the Lithuanians and the Latvians and the Estonians and like Ukrainians actually assisting the Germans in that. And so, you know, before anyone who's Lithuanian, Latvian, you, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. It's Christopher Browning, ordinary men, like look at it, see the argument. But that's accounts from the police battalion talking about um, – I'm loath even to say this because, you know, again, not my words. But, like, some of them made it seem like the Lithuanians were pretty gung-ho about it and some of the other people and gung-ho. And we kind of talked off camera how one of the issues the Red Army had is that, especially initially, before the Germans started doing repression, like – a lot of those people were really thrilled to see the Germans because they were tired of the USSR. And like one account from a uh, Polish Ukrainian teenager, he had just had a friend strung up and killed by ethnic Russians. And so he joined the partisans against the Soviets and he ends up the Germans like ship him to Austria and force him to work. And he ends up in a work camp, but you know, it, it's very complex with these non-Russian groups and their loyalties and how they just want to be their own nations, but they have these two massive, basically, empires fighting on their territory and trying to hold them. And 
you know, it's just very complex and very tragic. I'll, I'll put it that way. Yeah, I'm reading here uh, just some something about the 1930s uh, in Russia, well, in the Soviet Union. If you were of a mixed group of two different ethnicities, at the age of 16, you had to declare you were one or the other. They were that crazy about it. And we can see with, uh, well, I don't know what the, what the precise term was for when Stalin decided certain ethnic groups needed to be moved to different parts of the, um, the country which mm-hmm. was it's it's been linked to kind of i don't want to say the armenian genocide but it kept coming up in one article that they're basically death marching people off without food intentionally so that they would be killed and we mm-hmm. see this a lot with uh well Kozaks, of course are the first to go but uh ukrainians particularly were getting put on some of these marches to go east apparently to go uh to where the industry was because you know they had moved the industry after barbarossa but they were just mindlessly being tossed somewhere to die apparently Mm. i'm just trying to find this article was talking about the different groups because there's it's really as someone from a western country it's hard to imagine how many different ethnicities were involved during the soviet union and world war ii particularly like you usually you just learn okay after the october uh revolution you know the Cossacks were the first to go because they were seen as almost bourgeoisie they had the farms they were one of the few groups that was actually doing all right so then all the mm. other peasants came and took everything but there's a lot of different groups that also face a lot of scrutiny well yeah that's like you know reading the the hill book you know, in the 1930s, they, they talked about, like, the tartarization of the yeah. army. And that's why they kept, like, experimenting, breaking them up or putting them all together. And, you know, Hill talks about a lot of their accounts. Sometimes they were just filling in the gap and, like, official records rated their enthusiasm low. But at the same time, as we were discussing, like, looking at the occupations, you know, Hill also talks about in the 1920s, the Russians and, you know, the ethnic Russians at the top were very aware that they had just either captured or recaptured some of these places. And there was a lot of nationalistic sentiment. They didn't all want to be part of this global, you know, communist empire. And so a lot of the reason that they were viewed as lesser in fighting was enthusiasm. But then some of it, too, is just the language barrier. Like, I know a lot of people cite that's one of the issues with how Austria-Hungary fought in World War I. (laughs) Yeah. Is you have this giant multi-ethnic empire with so many different – how do you all coordinate militarily? And that's a lot of the Hastings – the Hastings stuff. And I'll try to find some quotes like the Russians really complained about – how broken the Russian was for like the Uzbeks and a lot of what they called the Tartars and how it made it really hard to communicate. And then when they would say something, it would just be like asking for food or something not military and a lot of frustration with that. I want to see if I can find the quote because it's it's kind of vicious, but it, it's one of those real things that reminds us that the Eastern Front was just kind of its own beast and you know like like as you say you know an american and a canadian we can read accounts and talk about it but uh we don't have like the oh sorry sorry. i was gonna say dan carlin he had one quote to try and emphasize how absolutely horrible the eastern front was and he was talking about how the soviets were using prisoners of war as uh they were pushing them forward hosing them down shooting them to make an ice land bridge so that their tanks could get over so mm-hmm. they're using just human bodies like it, honestly the eastern front people who don't thoroughly know that part of world war ii they they're missing out on some of the worst of humanity yeah like okay i think i'm in the right chapter i just gotta peruse it as we talk the uh and again it's beaver so i know i will have some people say like he's too harsh on the soviets but uh, Beaver had accounts of uh, Zhukov putting German prisoners and uh, political captives in the front of the tank units as they went west in Germany to clear minefields. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know all about that one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I have here deportation 
Oh yeah, okay, so 1941, there was a mass deportation of Karak oh my god, Karakaz, Kamaliks, Chechnins, English, Balkars, and the Crimean Tartars. 19 up until 1944 the Crimean Tartars mm -hmm. were moved around like crazy yeah and anyone who was ethnically German immediately after Operation Barbarossa was moved yeah oh man the ethnic like there was such a flight too as like the Soviet Red Army went into you know what's today Poland but back then was like Silesia and Poznan and Pomerania and Prussia like there was such a huge population shift and even to this day now like it is Poland Germans like millions I think it's like two to three million Germans fled west and I don't know if one of your articles say it but they were like the Volga Germans and like that was a very long-standing and entrenched group and even during the purges like uh, anyone who was ethnically German or Polish, especially, was targeted. Like, you know, the famous example is Rokozowski, who had his teeth knocked out. I, I like to think he's the inspiration for uh, Kulikov and Enemy at the Gates and is one of the more accurate parts of the movie. But like Rokozowski, because he was actually Polish, gets his teeth knocked out and is in jail for years. And then during Barbarossa, and this is why a lot of historians are kind of rethinking the purges, he does get let out because they're like, oh, we need you. Sorry about the teeth. Have some metal ones and look like Jaws from James Bond. <laughs> he was, And he was played by Ron Perlman, I believe, in Enemy at the Gates. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. That was interesting. He was, and that's, you know, I said that in the last one, like, that's pretty accurate and I get that, you know, Kulikov's not a real character, but he at least, like, represents Rokozovsky and that issue that for anyone in the Soviet Union, no matter if they were military or loyal or not, if they were Polish or German background, they were often regarded with suspicion. Well, it was like the uh, interim camps for the Japanese in the United States and Canada immediately tossed in. We don't like to talk about it too, too much. Oh yeah, we. Uh, why did that just pop up? When I think I Canada has more of a stigma because I think we had a larger, possibly had a larger population of Japanese. I know the United mm. States had the Japanese Act before us to make sure there wasn't because we were all gathering Asians to uh, build the railroads. I know Canada got a, I think we got a heftier portion of them, and then they all ended up in the interim camps. And God, what was the name of the actor on Star Trek? Takei? Uh, yeah, George Takei. Yeah, George Takei. He was in one of these, and he's an outspoken person about the hardship that they had to face through these. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's like, uh, you know, if it, if it doesn't look good on your country, you don't hear about it too much in uh, history books. Yeah, like, we, uh, we talked about that in my uh, middle school class, because we do a lot of document-based questions where we, like, look at old passages or look at pictures. And we did a picture of a Japanese internment camp, and I had to explain it. And it was kind of difficult for sixth graders because they, they, some of them have heard about the Holocaust. And then they see that, they're like, wait a minute, no, 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 that, like, we're America. We didn't do that. Like, well, no, we didn't kill them or work them to death, but we rounded them up. Come oh, on, excuse me. But we rounded them up just because of their ethnicity. Like, yeah. It was, it was a double play because also if they own businesses or their homes, like they're up for grabs. So a lot, a lot of people would just steal their things afterwards. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, the, the local population would probably be in on it. I, spe I know in Canada, especially in the Vancouver area, this was uh, really overkill done. Yeah. Can I totally break the momentum to finally do one of the quotes I've been looking for for like the entire conversation? Yeah, go for it. So talking about... Yeah, talking about the different ethnicities. Okay, so I have a quote from uh, Commissar Kalitov on September. Oh, no. Wrong one. Uh, Nikolai Bilov, so a Red Army soldier, described an inspection by a senior officer of the Army Battle Training Staff. And this is him talking about the Kazakhs. So they already had a name for them. They were the Yusefs. And he says, quote, Results deplorable. The Yusefs cannot turn left or right. What a terrible lot. Complete muttonheads. If we are given more Kazakhs, we consider ourselves doomed. Like, 
and that's not the I'll try to find the others but like there's multiple quotes in here talking about like the Uzbeks and the Kazakhs and like that from the ethnic uh, this book the Hastings book because it, it really without trafficking in like the tropes of enemy at the gates it does definitely show that critical side of the Red Army like these were often dudes going through some serious stuff and, you know, like an American or British soldier couldn't really fathom these types of issues. I Maybe you could argue the people of Asian descent or blacks fighting for the allies might have seen... I mean, it's not the same. Like, it's a different beast of its own. Mm. It's, there's discrimination, and then there's you're an ethnic group who gets put in certain penal battalions just because you're ethnicity, so you'll die. <laughs> yeah, but you're right that you know there was definitely segregation. Like the Red Ball Express is a very famous example. Like, it, as far as and I gotta reread all, all my uh, shoot. What's his name? Rick Atkinson who, you know, he's doing a lot of good work on the Western Front, kind of updating the old uh, Cornelius Ryan books and the old uh, Stephen Ambrose books. But, yeah, talking about most black soldiers ended up in logistics in the United States Army. And even, you know, with, like, the Tuskegee Airmen, it was a segregated unit. It's very famous because they were really good at bomber defense and at the highest rate of bombers saved and whatnot, but... Like you mentioned the Japanese, I wish I remember the name, but there was a Japanese American battalion mm -hmm, in yeah. Europe because they weren't allowed to fight Japan because the U.S. government was afraid yeah. that they would desert or collaborate or here I'll use a loaded word or they would collude. And then <laughs> so they were forced to only fight the Europeans, even though they were patriots and wanted to do what's best for their country. Yeah, they were treated terribly. I, oh God, I can't remember the. There was a documentary that was showing some of it. It was in. It was very interesting. It's it's little known facts like that. Like there, there there's always very strange stories during the war. I, I remember there's this horrible movie, and it's one of the most <laughs> inaccurate films ever made. But it's talking about the story of some South Koreans who were fighting for the Japanese Empire. They get captured by the Russians in that first skirmish in '39. They end up... Uh, Kalking Goal, the big one where the yeah. Soviets actually did what they were supposed to with? Yeah. Okay. And then they end up fighting for the USSR. You, they fight for the USSR, get put in a camp. It gets liberated by the Germans. Germans find these South Koreans, and they're like, oh, you're f mm. originally fighting for the Japanese. Well, come, we need you. You're our allies. They bring them to <laughs> Normandy to, you know, fight Jeez. the invasion. But the funniest thing, I don't know if you heard about this... When the Allies were storming some of these bunkers in Normandy, they found a bunch of Asians in German uniforms. And it turns out it's true. A bunch of South Koreans ended up in Normandy <laughs> fighting for wow. the Germans. So it's a weird... The movie is hor like It's very inaccurate because it, it really plays with some unbelievable chants and stuff. It's really for... It's Hollywood-like. And it's a, it's yeah. a foreign film, but it, it has some merit and truth to it. It's an interesting fact that, yeah, there was this instance in which some South Koreans ended up in the USSR because of the fight at the beginning and they ended up hmm. uh, getting taken for this battalion of arabs uh south koreans and i dare say some people from northern africa got put in this weird last minute german regiment just to throw hmm. at the allies that's really off topic but <laughs> yeah yeah I... and that's one of the things um hastings also does and the reason i like his book because he has a lot of accounts talking about being in the Red Army and how rough it was. This is one of the few books I've seen that is very candid about the Western powers having empires. And, you know, I know as an American, I'm almost like genetically conditioned not to talk about the Philippines. <laughs> and not to talk about the different islands that we had and Britain, you know, the Bengali famine. America was and, never an empire. Yeah, and Indian soldiers and, you know, the Raj and like the French, you know, the territorial uh, units and the fortress brigades and whatnot. But like you mentioned, 
these it was a world war and these were world empires and they drew on those troops and so it wasn't just the soviets throwing in kazakhs and uzbeks and you know crimean tartars and cossacks but it was america and britain and france and japan and you know japan had an empire like they were that's one of the issues they were so imperialistic that they ran into america and britain in the netherlands spheres and then you we know how that went they wanted to play in the same ballpark mm -hmm. their their whole argument they did. you know was always you got to colonize why can't we and it, it is fascinating like you think they go from having this great peaceful time for uh i can do math 230 some odd years close enough i'm a social studies teacher my day job so <laughs> close enough 230 years of like a peaceful golden age and then when america forces them to be more open and not just trade with the dutch sometimes they're like oh we're we have muskets still because why wouldn't we we don't need to fight with this lovely golden age you've got battleships huh we yeah. need to work this out and then they have their meiji restoration in their massive civil war and then by 1904 1905 they beat a european power oh, and then yeah. by the 20s and 30s they're carving out an asian empire like it, it, it's just within 50 years japan goes from fearing being colonized that's one of the reasons the meiji restoration popped off is a lot of you know japanese factions were like we're gonna get taken over look at the opium war like we're next do you not see america trying it and then they end up fighting america because they've caught up so quickly and so violently that now america's threatened they're like no we're not going to give you oil unless you chill out in china it's really funny you mentioned that because it, it's true. The whole Meiji Restoration, they dressed like all the European powers. They had their royal bank banquets. They, they sent all their people to different countries to learn from the Prussians how to be soldiers, mm -hmm. to learn the Navy from the British, to learn everything from the States. People were you know, going to Harvard. And they did all this to not get colonized. And then they end up going to war with the United States of America. It's actually really tragic. It It, it is, and it's tragic for the... Uh, Japanese people and I was actually I'm gonna watch how I say this because you know but I was interested to learn because I don't know if you saw the news articles but Japan just had their new emperor yeah um, the old the old one abdicated and there's the new one um, but they were talking about the the last emperor before this new one his his dad and how famous his dad was and how his dad when, when Japanese emperors step down they get a new name that kind of describes their era and they're like oh yeah the new emperor's grandpa was the era of peace and oh let me look it up and i'm like peace i'm like it can't be hirohito can it <laughs> like there's no way and it was yeah and i'm like yeah what's the japanese name i'm gonna butcher it but uh yeah akihito was the one who just stepped down uh, Showa. I probably destroyed that, but Showa, which is peace. Mm -hmm. Like, and looking into some really tertiary sources, so I could be talking out of my ass, it's not impossible. But a lot of that was like MacArthur and the Americans recognizing, like, okay, we fought it out, we nuked them, killed a lot, leveled Tokyo. But now we need them in our fold. We got this Cold War popping off. Yeah. Let's let's chill out. And, and you know, and there's definitely articles and arguments that America had a lot to do with not going after the emperor. So there would be some continuity to allow the reconstruction of Japan. Yeah, I think it's referred to as the the secret letter. But base uh, this, I I never want to touch this. I I wanted to make a video originally about this, but seeing the backlash from American audiences when I was talking about war crimes, you know, I, I think Canada and, mm -hmm. and the United States, I think we're taught the same thing in high school about the nuclear bombs going off. That you know, the justification was it was to save lives, and it you know there was a rationale behind it, and it had to be done. But the real reason the nukes were dropped was because the Soviet Union was breaking through Manchukuo, and the Soviets we're probably going to take Japan. And like you said, Mac MacArthur, everyone in the United States was very aware what was going to happen after the war. 
and they needed Japan in their back pocket. So they said, okay, mm -hmm. the biggest deal that Japan has right now is they want the emperor to live because it's the whole structure of their society. And they would crumble. Yes, they would crumble into a republic or something horrible would happen to them from their point of view. So, you know, the unconditional surrender the United States always had on the table there, they kind of slid it in that, mm -hmm. okay, we will not get rid of your emperor. You know, you're basically going to be a little puppet government for us, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how it kind of played through. But you, the United States, you can argue, wrote the new constitution of Japan. Mm -hmm. That's, it, for lack of better words, that's how it went. Yeah. They, they dictated everything. Yeah, and, you know, I don't have the evidence for, like, the amount of laws in the constitution, like, actually, like you say. But I would definitely argue economically that was the u.s kind of updating dollar diplomacy for after world war ii yeah. like between the marshall plan by rebuilding you know western europe and parts of central europe and by rebuilding japan and dumping money in we basically economically carved out a sphere that then became a geopolitical and military alliance oh you know i didn't explain the um Sorry, um, from the Japanese point of view, I'll explain this because this, honestly, you're only going to ever really hear in depth about this in uh, an actual Japanese history course. But the Japanese mm. government, when the bombs went off, uh, they weren't aware the bombs went off. Like, when the f by the time they heard about the first bomb, the second bomb had already gone off. So basically, the Japanese were trying to get a deal out of the Allies. So it was either the USSR or it was, you know, the United States at that point. And when they were on the breaking point where they just knew they had to surrender the only information they had was the soviet union has declared war and they're breaking through the manchuria area which to them was more important than anything else because they honestly mm. saw the continent as their survival because of the resources obviously the steel and everything yeah. that was in manchuko so mm. i know it's hard for people to accept this but as i was taught by quite a few teachers the ussr to the Japanese, from their point of view, breaking through Manchuria was more of a threat than the mainland invasion of their country. And I know that sounds crazy, but when they were trying to write the terms of surrender because they were caving to the idea that uh, they had to do it unconditional, but they were just trying to mm. broker a deal basically to save the emperor, they were trying to broker with the USSR, but when that happened, it terrified the shit out of them. And they basically mm -hmm. jumped into the arms of the Americans, but the Americans, basically were nuking after you could argue the Japanese were fully ready to surrender. <laughs> so I'm curious, th those courses and things, did Japan think they were going to get to at least keep like Korea and Manchukuo and oh, yes. some of their older conquest? Really? They no. thought they were going to hold on to the older stuff. Their, their strategy was to surrender as soon as possible to try and hold it. Because basically they realized in 39 oh my god the soviets will destroy our army our navy is one thing but our northern army we could not go to siberia to save our lives they knew they couldn't mm -hmm. hold manchuria they thought maybe they could hold a bit of china and south korea was a given they thought they would never lose south korea when japan surrendered the united states and had to cave to the south korean issue they were it was like they were aghast at the idea mm. because that was their um agricultural hub i guess you would call it well yeah i mean they had what was one of the invasions 1598 that had been a aim well into their past mm -hmm. the um the south koreans were for lack of better words their colony for a very long time but ethnically they're the same because yeah that's uh point of contention right now <laughs> yeah you're gonna get some hate on that but i i took a east asian studies class and <laughs> yeah there are arguments that japan is an island and people most likely migrated from somewhere and south korea is the closest point so I there are definitely arguments and i know i know japanese scientists there are definitely those who disagree but i know a lot of western scientists say Probably people came from Korea. Geographically, it makes sense. Oh, I know this video was about <laughs> the Winter War and the USSR and diversity. Sorry, I, I, I specialized in the Pacific War, so especially mm. the Japanese point of view. I, I had a lot of teachers who were Canadian and 
they had like Jap- well one of my teachers he had uh his wife is from japan and he doesn't have citizenship because mm-hmm. it's kind of it's tricky with japan but he was teaching yeah. us both points of view so we would have a comparative between uh one one course i really liked he had uh eugene sledge's you know novelization uh mm-hmm. uh the old breed i think that's what it's called sledge was not the old breed yeah the other one lucky was helmet helmet for my pillow was lucky yeah you're right old breed was sledge so he had uh it was a novel well it was uh, a take from an officer i forget it was yakamoto uh Yakamura. He was fighting in the Battle of Okinawa. Mm. It was his take on what was going on in when he was preparing Okinawa. And Sledge and him, they um, they have the same story. It's just from different viewpoints. So if you take both of them at their words and you look at like 50-50, you can actually get a good image of how it went. And I thought that was really interesting to learn from the other viewpoint because honestly, if you're learning World War II, you, especially in the Pacific War, you hardly get to learn from the other side. It's usually... The Americans explain how it was done, which islands were taken, Midway, very important, and then, you know, mm. fire bombings at Tokyo, nukes were done. But from the Japanese point of view, it's all directed at Russia and what's going on in the continent. It's crazy. They're, the way that they were viewing the war, because they put so much emphasis on that side, and you would, you would expect, you know, from our, especially how we learned, that the most important mm. thing was all the islands they were losing, because that was also oil and some industry. But yeah, I found it was very uh, surprising learning what I did. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, because, you know, there's there's some of it in Hastings. But if you look at my big stack here, Eastern Front and Western Front is usually where I go. But uh, I mean, the original war aim of Japan was simply to cow America into lifting the embargo and selling them oil and other resources again. Like, am, am I correct on that? Like, they didn't want to take much from us. They wanted to do whatever they needed to to get us to sell them oil so they could beat China. Yeah, they had two strategies. The army had the northern strategy. I, I forget the Japanese terminology. And the navy had what was hmm. the southern strategy. Um, if you, well, basically the way that Japan worked was the navy and the army were fighting for funds. And the navy hmm. had a little bit, they had a bit more of an edge politically. So... The Navy put a gun to the like political head of Japan and said, okay, we're going with the Southern strategy, give us all the funds. The Army, the Northern strategy was this, and I'm going to say it was a suicidal attempt to take Siberia and get the oil fields there. Because they said, well, we can pr- pretty much supplement our entire economy if we get the oil fields. That's all we need. Because the whole thing was mm. America, the oil embargo. But that, that was not really possible. Neither was the Southern strategy, obviously, as we can see. But yeah, they said, okay, well... We have a lot of people that have been studying the United States. They know they knew all the capabilities of the states, unlike Hitler and the Germans, who did not have a great keen aspect of what productivity looked like in the states. The Japanese were fully aware what it was going to look like, and they said, "If we can hit them, you know, certainly this hard, and then we, you know, go and embed ourselves in every single one of these islands, and we just make it so painful for them to attack us, eventually they'll give up this war, you know, because <laughs> they, I, I mean, you read it all the time." economically it would hurt them too much because they honestly thought americans thought in dollar bills which certainly Mm. was not the case because america was really really ready to spill blood (laughs) like Mm -hmm. american blood to get those islands like it's it's the pacific war is fascinating it is and there are speaking of ready there are definitely arguments that churchill but also roosevelt wanted that to go down that way that they they wanted us involved with germany and the way to get that was japan and i've even seen arguments not that i believe them but they do exist that the reason the carriers were out and the battleships were at port (laughs) was to provide a tempting target that would not be crippling that they wouldn't get the carriers but they would be tempted to attack the battleships and that would give us the justification we needed to enter the war. Yeah, there's a and ton. I've I've seen that. I don't know if I believe it. My teacher used I've to call it, it. Uh, the 9/11 conspiracy theory of Pearl Harbor. Mm-hmm. But you're right. It's why were those car- like to this day? You Pearl Harbor is fascinating. Why were those carriers gone? Pearl Pearl Harbor is fascinating. Just you know, hoping that America and I almost see the logic like if you 
just look at what was deployed. Now, like you say, a lot of the technicians knew better, and that's, uh, you know, like Yamamoto, he, he knew exactly. He's like, yeah, six months, and then we're screwed, but... Yeah. I get if you just looked at our rankings, like, the U.S. was behind Romania as far as standing army, and... You know, there's video from the 1920s and 30s of, like, the U.S. dummy tanks launching flour to train and, like, men reporting in, like, suits for their reserve training and then, like, going to the bar and getting drunk. Now, I, I gotta watch what I say because I think one of those was in Minnesota or Wisconsin. And before, before any Minnesotans or Wisconsins, like, I'm from Michigan. It's cold here, too. We drink, too. Like, don't worry about it, but... Yeah, I can almost see that. But like you say, like Yamamoto and some of those dudes have been American educated and they knew like if the U.S. geared its industry towards war, it was going to be trouble. And it just boggles my mind that in World War II, you have both of the most industrialized powers on Earth take the same side. But then unsurprisingly, once the war is over, you have the two most powerful countries on Earth, most industrialized countries, biggest armies decide oh yeah we don't like each other now we're kind of threatened yep and uh might i add with uh it wasn't yamamoto but one of his subordinates that was educated in the united states he visited a bunch of ford factories because he was actually calculating what it would look like if they went full war productivity mm -hmm. they, they were um united states you know it, it's an open country just like canada a lot of people could come in and learn before making any preparations. And I don't know why, you don't ever hear, like, I know the Germans, like, did some calculations, but nowhere close to the Japanese. Like, the Japanese, like you said, Yamamoto said, yeah, six months, and mm -hmm. then we're done. They do. And like I said in the last part, he was so right, like, almost to the day of Midway. Like, that's really prophetic. <laughs> but, you know, at the same time, trust those dudes because one of the stories of Bar Barbarossa we don't always talk about same thing happened the uh, Lotus Titians and uh, Wagner who <laughs> I don't have you played a uh... no never mind I'm gonna shut up this will get hate if I even use this word but uh if you've ever played the game up or uh decisive campaigns Barbarossa logistics is a big part and Wagner's in the game and he's very obsessed with trucks and trains and stuff, but, uh, and he, he got a nickname from that, but I'm going to watch it and not get us more hate. But <laughs> Wagner basically said, like, okay, if we invade the Soviet Union, we have 700 kilometers and we'll have to stop. And then if we want to go further, we'll go further. Now, he, he said 700 kilometers. That's what we can do in a jump. That was almost the distance from central Poland, the way Poland was back then, to Smolensk. And Smolensk was the big, like the first big stop. Oof. And then it was about 700 kilometers more from where Fall Blau was in, you know, June 28th of 1942 to where they got to at Stalingrad. That was also about 700. Like, he knew very well with German production that's what it's going to be and you, you read some of these accounts and wonder if they're from the future or if they just had really sage advice that other people should have followed more thoroughly which you know I, I think i'd go with that one if you ever i don't know the author of this it was it's an american military report and uh, i found it on jstor database it's from mm -hmm. 1940 or 19 Nine, no, it's from 1941, and it's a naval officer, he's a high-ranked official, talking about how he thinks aircraft carriers will be the future of the military operations in the Navy. And he's trying to explain why battleships are just too outdated to use. And it's so fascinating because it's written in that time period, and it's prophetic, like... He, I, I know a lot of people understood, like, aircraft carriers were going to take over, but for the time period he was writing... <laughs> And mm -hmm. then you look at the devastation at Pearl Harbor and everything, and then you see how World War II unfolded in the Pacific and what role aircraft carriers played. It's uh, I always find that's like a time capsule reading that. And then you read, you know, everybody in the 1970s is talking about the Pacific War. Yes, of course, aircraft carriers and the way that, you know, you had the squadrons going out looking for the kamikaze pilots made that so they were inefficient, etc. Uh, mm. I loved, uh, it's been a long time since I've been in academia. <laughs> I really miss uh, reading. 
I know that's like today my wife thought I was crazy. I sent her a picture of all my books stacked up because I'm going to try to do a documentary on Stalingrad. I've been so inspired by constant debates in my comment section on Enemy at the Gates. I decided like, you know what, instead of having the same debate, I'm just going to do a very comprehensive documentary and hopefully I'll cover all this nuance and won't have to. And I sent her a picture of like these 10 books, which isn't even all of them. It doesn't even count the like audio books and the Kindle ones. And she's just like, you're a crazy person. You're not getting paid for that. Like, yeah, but it's fun. Academia is fun. Like I enjoy having these conversations. That's one of the things I liked about grad school is because it's more focused on like hist historiography instead of just getting lectured at a lot of graduate levels like the 600s and above you do readings and then you just discuss with the class with the professor interpretations yeah and where it fits in the historiography and it's just fun it's like you're exercising your history brain muscles you can tell i took a lot of physiology classes on that one <laughs> <laughs> but it is it's just so fascinating yeah, and I always I always have to kind of readjust myself because I, I in case people are seeing this from your viewpoint, I, I have a history degree, but my my degree I use for work is actually neuroscience. So mm -hmm. when I'm looking for articles, I have this problem because I, I I'm used to using certain databases, and for for the scientific community over there, it's just it's completely different, and how you write is completely different. And I've caught myself in a lot of traps when when speaking to like let's say a professor. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll I'll throw terms about I, I don't know I'll speak like a in sociological terms or something else and I'll be thinking of some topic mm. and he's like okay that's nice but you need to get on topic of the historiography of what's going on here and there and I was looking probably at some kind of population thing at the time or this and that mm. yeah I do miss academia yeah that's I think you know at the time of this recording. As long as my last paper gets signed off on, I'm done, and the master should be just about ready. Congrats. I'm hoping. Yeah, thank you. But it has, that's the thing. It has nothing to do with the Eastern Front. Like, it's always a struggle. This paper was um, talking about the Lost Boys of Sudan and um, trying to combine a lot of the primary source data and their memoirs and interviews with the academic articles that really kind of tapered off after 2008. So, you know, that that's one of my final papers is The Lost Boys of Sudan. And then the other one was about a reformer in Detroit in the 1890s and how he went to war with the Detroit streetcar company. So I'm just curious because <laughs> I don't know if it's different uh, for universities in the States. What kind of databases do you usually use for history? Um, we use a lot of JSTOR, but actually my, my university, they got some good ones. Like the library website gets me into all sorts of stuff, but JSTOR is the big one. There's also, I'm on the wrong computer. Let me see. Cause I don't have all my login detailed. There's a new one that I hadn't heard of before I went back to school, but they seem like they've been buying up a lot of, a lot of stuff. It's like some, some group and they've been muse. No, not muse. Oh God. I'm never going to remember this login. But it's like they they got the lamp uh, learning and whatever and then they make me mad because half the stuff they want you to pay for or even though what, but you're it's part routed of through the university website yeah and it's like why do why do you want me to pay for this just let me have it really that's i've never seen Honestly, that before maybe franklin, oh, franklin. Okay. is that right i don't know and i'm not i'm not gonna be able to look at it on this computer i can't remember my login because again i'm deserving of a master's degree <laughs> can't remember one of my logins but yeah, J J stores a lot of it. I, I and just it's my fallback, honestly. J stores oh, has been there for so long. I, I always fall upon it, and you can, even for psychological things, J store is great too. Uh, mm -hmm. Neuroscience, yeah, yeah, I've used it for that too. Yeah, the university website though is really good because it has a thing like a little icon that says if it's peer reviewed or not, and you know, a lot of the. Uh, stuff with the lost boys i've needed like journalism and sociology for because 
when you when you talk about the Lost Boys and any refugee population, how they acculturate to the host country is definitely based on like the psychology of what they've gone through with the civil war and fleeing and being a refugee, but also like the um, anthropological aspects of like, what was their home society versus what is the ho like host society like, and what is that adjustment? And it's a lot of like race and gender and hierarchy. And so, you know, I was thinking like, it's weird that your professor sometimes would like check you on that. Cause I've noticed a lot of the history in the last couple of years, at least my university, they've been big on trying to be like cross curricular and bring in those other um, disciplines. Oh, uh, they are. Things uh, like that. One of the last classes I took was um, the Atlantic worlds and, you know, uh, the sub genre of history, just based off the Atlantic, uh, mostly about the slave trade, the founding of <clears throat> America and mm -hmm. the other colonies. And um, it was a, fem a female professor. Actually, she's tenured too. I forget her name. I had her a year ago, but she she had a really difficult time teaching this class because she was terrified of speaking about anything revolving around race. And half the curriculum mm -hmm. is about the slave trade. I couldn't believe watching her wa walking on eggshells to just explain to the younger kids in the class who I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say they were like 20 year olds, social mm. kind of justice warrior types to hear that Africa had a slave trade before Europeans showed up was surprising for them. And the teacher felt like she had to baby them through this. It was, it was hilarious. I think academia I mean, is like going through a rough patch right now. And that's, maybe it's been interesting because my professor that I've taken on the, uh, both African diasporas, well, I shouldn't say both. There's three waves, but, uh, I took one on the transatlantic slave trade and I've taken one on like after the 1950s and 60s, very Cold War based like African refugees, but he's Ethiopian. And so it's definitely interesting to see his perspective and like the class we took. I mean, we looked at, you know, the Islamic slave trade and how even like Christian Ethiopia had pagan neighbors and I shouldn't say pagan, uh, like traditional and animalist. And like, they didn't care. And they would sell them to like, you know, Arabia and like India because they wanted resources. And it's like, well, I'm a Christian empire. They're not Christian. What do I care? And just, I think people too with the eggshells and, you know, I, I say this from my political leaning, but like Africa is not a monolith. And I would disagree with people saying something like Africans sold themselves into slavery because they were different tribes and different nations, yeah. but like there was a slave trade and a long tradition in Africa. I have to bring this up because I, I just couldn't believe it. Speaking about the Islamic slave trade when they were starting off in Africa, mm. there was someone of Middle Eastern descent and he stood up when he heard about this and he said, that's impossible. Where are you getting your sources? And I couldn't, I, I couldn't believe it. But I mean, they were. Uh -huh. it, it was a. It was a level two, uh, level three hundred course. So you're expecting a lot younger mm -hmm. students. So yeah, there were some naive students who were probably maybe not even in history. They could have taken it. Well, actually, three hundred. No, they couldn't have. But uh, younger students. Yeah, that's uh, one thing I liked about that. And oh, what are my books? Um, one is Black Morocco. I, I remember that one. Uh, one is something black slaves, Muslim masters. Let me see if that's the title. But they they are actually interesting studies. Oh, Christian slaves, Muslim masters. That's one about white slavery in the Mediterranean. And a lot of them, they quote the Quran and they show all the passages that say, yeah, you're not supposed to take slaves. But then these books also show the ambiguous ones. And like one of the books about it is really, it was like 700 pages. It, it is a good study in religion, how with any religion, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, you can take what you want, leave what you want if you have a certain agenda. Mm -hmm. And like it showed like, here are all the passages that say don't have slavery. Here's all the passages that say certain don't have Muslims as slaves if you're Muslim. Here's passages that say Christians and Jews shouldn't be slaves because, you know, they're ranked too. And here's some really ambiguous pat. And it talked about how, like, with the Quran and with Islam, 
oh god i don't remember the arabic names for anything but there's like there's different categories there's like the stuff that's definitely said by the prophet muhammad and then there's stuff that like some dudes say was said by muhammad yeah of course and it, and it's like <laughs> you know depending how devout you are and which school of thought you can stick to like no let's be very historical let's only in the stuff we know he said but then there's the camps that are like well a guy heard from a guy who heard from a guy who heard from a guy he said it was probably okay they're not muslim uh so and um, just I, i'm just gonna how long do you think we should go on <laughs> with this video i've just realized we're touching i guess an hour and 30 um however long you like like we can keep going i can even go grab all those books and we can really piss off everyone of all persuasions by digging into that or we can just call it because an hour and a half is plenty i am fine with either how about we'll call it here but for your next if for the next time we do this we should we should definitely delve into the books that you're speaking of because i have to say at least 50 percent i've never seen or read so i really am interested oh my god it's so interesting because slavery and, you know, we can talk about some of this, but like slavery in Africa and the Middle East and India was very different. And yeah. that's another thing. Like people think of slaves being property and slaves working in fields and like some of the most highly praised slaves in like the Arabic world were pretty ladies who could sing, dance, tell poems so that if you had one in your household like you could literally host parties and be like hey entertain them look at me i'm so rich like i'm putting on a show for you and like domestic slavery was a big thing and like we could talk about how some of the theory was you know there were schools of thought in islam that slavery was good because it's a way to force convert because you know in islam there wasn't always generational slavery so some groups of people in some empires would justify it like oh if we take slaves we can convert them and then their children will be muslims and so in a generation or two we will like culturally conquest and we could talk about how in india there were black slaves taken you know it's hard to tell from where because they were often called uh habshi or city which uh i'll delve into that but like they actually set up two dynasties in india and they were able to have their own empires when they were descended from like Abyssinian slaves. So, I am so ignorant towards Indian history, and someone has called me out on it because I dwelled into Alexander the Great a lot. So obviously, mm -hmm. I have to speak of his minor wars when he was uh, invading what is present-day India, and then the aftermath because India went through this whole Hellenization phase of its own. But um, yeah, I've been called out quite a few times. India is something i am absolutely ignorant towards i don't know anything about the royal families at the beginning or how they dealt with anything up until world war one when they're shoved in there i can really just talk about slavery in india like mostly black slavery in india but it's really fascinating because like you mentioned um in academia because america has dominated a lot of slave research and African Americans by extension have been leading that because you know it's very relevant to US history a lot when people think slavery like really we just think about like the American version and like even the Caribbean and South America where more slaves were actually sent by a huge margin that's not as well understood is like chattel slavery just within the realm of the united states it's and there's it's insignificant if you look at the proportion of slaves that went to the caribbean or south america particularly in brazil mm -hmm. the united states has like six percent yet all of the people who rave about i'm, I'm sorry to say like the the hor the true the hor slavery is horrible all the horrors of slavery mm. they are only talking about what happened in a small part of the united states it's insignificant in the large realm of everything that was going on. They should honestly focus more on Brazil at this point. And that's, you know, and we, we can talk about this more and I can pull up my articles, but it even leads to misunderstandings because how race is viewed in America is very 
different than Brazil, but Brazil's very different than like some of the places around it. And the idea of like what it means to be black or white or mixed is not at all the same in the Caribbean or in different parts of South America yeah. or in the US. Yet when a lot of, you know, monographs are written, it's about being black in America. Mm -hmm. And this is slavery. This is what it means to be African American. But, you know, people who are mixed race, you know, quote unquote mixed race or like part African or even full African descendant in Brazil, that doesn't apply to all. And like the cities in India, like there are still descendants of the cities in the Hopshis in India. And when we're writing about slavery, how can we say that like this plantation culture and like, you know, this eventual Christianization and all that, stuff, like that doesn't apply to them at all. Completely different. And so, yeah, that, that's one of the issues, like, and I, I know there will be Americans who say like, are you trying to downplay it? Yeah, no, I'm not, but I'm saying academically, a lot of what people think of as slavery is just informed by the United States and what it means to be African American. I had a. Uh... Well, oh, sorry, go. I was just gonna say, writing about African refugees, and this is a whole nother issue. And you know, I'm sure I'll be told like I'm American. What can I say about it? <laughs> but like, African refugees and African Americans do not always get along. And a lot of African, a lot of, there's, there's a lot of generational problems and we can say this for a later video, but like African refugees come over here and then their children become Americanized in the African American community and, you know, they become more independent and, and, but also they're viewed differently if they're viewed as black, you know, they're viewed differently by like power structures and then there's huge generational classes or clashes, excuse me. And these parents are like, wait, did you just tell me no? Like, you wouldn't have told me no back in Africa. Like, what? what is this? What's happening? America, what are you doing? Like, it just is so interesting. Well, seeing that we've gone from being hated for topics involved around Barbarossa and Stalingrad, and then we talked about the Islamic slave trade, so there's going to be a lot of angry Middle Easterners. Now we're going to probably have a lot of uh, African Americans hating this video, so maybe we'll cut it there for now and uh, delve into that subject uh, next time. Yeah, we can, but I, I promise everyone who listens, I'll cite sources, I'll bring books, and like I said, none of these authors are saying the Quran expressly says it's a good thing people read into it what they want and that's that's yeah. history yeah look at it today look how the interpretations of the quran are quite different for different groups you go to uh, yeah. one middle eastern country and then go to another one and it will be very different because they're not all the same people have a hard time understanding that oh uh, yes and getting into like the you know what is a sufi versus those other schools oh God. <laughs> uh, but I, I won't get into that because I'm too ignorant. I've seen good explanations and I'm like, wow, it is way more complex than me as a Westerner ever thought. <laughs> but I have not done the research. I would be completely talking out of my ass. The best I know is in Europa Universalis 4, if you pick the Ottomans, you click a little button and you, you can change your school and you get bonuses. That's that's what I know. <laughs> that's as far as I've gotten. I'm like, what is, you know, Sufism and the, the different schools of Islam? Uh, I just, I, yeah. Well, thank you everyone for listening. Um, we were really happy to have Craig from NBS History. So Craig, thanks for stopping by. It was a pleasure. And where can people find you all over the internet if you have anything you want to plug? Yeah, you can find me on YouTube at NBS History, Twitter, NBS History, and uh, that's, that's about it. All right, and this has been History Clarified, being boring and talking out of my ass, having fun. <laughs> Um, thank you guys and stay excited about history. See you next time.